The Halloween Documents When Microsoft Declared Open Season on Linux 1998-2025 Retrospective Friday, October 30, 1998 Seattle's sky had been weeping all week. Inside Redmond, most Microsoft staff were counting down to a costume party, but one anonymous employee slipped a Word file into an email addressed to Eric S. Raymond. By sundown, the file titled Linux underscore open underscore source underscore OSS underscore strategy dot doc and branded Microsoft Confidential was mirrored on a dozen FTP sites. Halloween came early for the open source world, and the mask that dropped was Microsoft's. The memo, soon dubbed Halloween One, described Linux and its collaborative development model as a direct short-term revenue and platform threat. It laid out response tactics, embrace open internet protocols, extend them with proprietary hooks, then watch rivals wither. Within days, two more leaks followed. Tech reporters began speaking collectively of the Halloween documents. Why a free operating system terrified Redmond. By late 1998, Linux was still a command-line curiosity for most home users, but it powered web servers, rendered movie effects, and importantly, ran reliably on cheap Intel hardware. The memos revealed Microsoft engineers running benchmarks against Windows NT and losing. Worse, Linux came wrapped in the GNU General Public License. Anyone could copy and improve it, yet no one could privatize it. For a company whose profits flowed from per-seat licenses, an operating system that spread virally at zero price looked like an existential pathogen. The memo's panic tone, half-threat assessment, half-admiration, confessed as much. Inside the playbook decommoditized the protocols. The most infamous line recommended decommoditizing protocols. HTTP, SMTP, Kerberos, these belonged to no vendor, so Microsoft would graft extras onto them, persuading partners and ISVs to rely on the tweaks. Rivals who stuck to the public spec would appear buggy. Those who followed the extensions would incur Microsoft patent tolls. It was the digital equivalent of rewriting road rules to fit only your brand of car. Another slide proposed sowing FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt about the GPL. If corporate lawyers believed the license might infect proprietary code, they'd veto Linux deals before the first server booted. A leak at the worst possible moment. The U.S. Department of Justice had already dragged Microsoft into court for bundling Internet Explorer with Windows. Now, prosecutors could quote Redmond's own words about monopolistic tactics. The European Commission soon opened parallel investigations into Microsoft's stranglehold on workgroup servers. Suddenly, what Redmond called just brainstorming looked like a smoking gun. Community counterattack. Hackers turned outrage into art. Slashdot sold t-shirts reading Decommoditize This under a flaming tux penguin. Developers accelerated work on Samba, an open re-implementation of Microsoft's file-sharing protocol, so Windows machines could talk to Linux without proprietary pieces. IBM pledged a billion-dollar investment in Linux. Red Hat's 1999 IPO smashed Wall Street records for a first-day pop, proving that free software could mint real money. War in the trenches, patents, file formats, benchmarks, patents. In 2007, Microsoft claimed Linux infringed 235 of its patents, hinting at royalties. Open source vendors called the bluff. No lawsuit followed, but the chill slowed some corporate migrations. File formats, offices, binary, dot doc, and docsls acted as data prisons. In response, Sun and the open source community launched OpenOffice and its XML-based format, later ratified as Open Document by ISO. Benchmarks, each Windows Server release arrived with speed graphs designed to bury earlier Linux victories. Kernel developers responded with scheduler rewrites and NUMA tuning until web hosters quietly standardized on the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MISQL, PHP, slash Python, slash Perl, through every skirmish ran the phrase embrace, extend, extinguish, first uncovered in Halloween 1, then echoed in antitrust testimony. A turning tide clouds, mobile, containers. 
The strategy that once kept competitors off the desktop faltered in the cloud. When Amazon Web Services launched in 2006, the new data center lingua franca was Linux. Startups wrote their first lines of code on Ubuntu instances, not Windows. Google's Android, another Linux derivative, grabbed handset share at breakneck speed, denying Windows Phone oxygen. Docker's container format shipped with Alpine Linux bases by default. Microsoft's own Azure Cloud debuted in 2010 as a Windows-centric platform, but within two years offered official Ubuntu images. Market demand, not altruism, forced the pivot. Satya's Olive Branch In October 2014, Satya Nadella stepped on stage and clicked a slide that read Microsoft Loves Linux. Analysts gasped, veteran developers rolled their eyes, but the numbers backed him. A fifth of Azure virtual machines already ran Linux, and the share would soon cross the halfway mark. Nadella greenlit SQL Server on Linux, acquired GitHub, and welcomed Debian maintainers to campus summits. Windows 10 shipped the Windows subsystem for Linux, letting developers run unmodified ELF binaries beside Notepad. Was this embrace without extend? Skeptics noted teams still used proprietary APIs and Visual Studio's telemetry defaults proved sticky, yet the change in tone from eradication to coexistence was undeniable. Collateral Legends SEO Mono and the Media Narrative the SEO lawsuit from 2003 to 2007 tried to litigate Linux into oblivion by alleging Unix code theft. Microsoft bankrolled SEO's war chest through license purchases, reusing the Halloween tactic of legal siege. Courts eventually tossed the claims. Mono and Netcore inverted the old play open source engineers implemented Microsoft Tech so it could run on Linux. Years later, Microsoft itself open sourced Net, collapsing the dichotomy. Press cycles. From Wired's Microsoft's mask slips to New York Times editorials, the memos became cultural shorthand for corporate hubris, cited whenever a giant seemed to bully an upstart. Legacy code how the documents changed tech governance, transparency is armor. After 1998, major open source projects adopted public roadmaps and mailing list RFCs, believing sunlight would inoculate them against secret protocol sabotage. Standard bodies weaponized, Oasis, W3C, and ISO gained fresh relevance as neutral platforms defining open specs immune to unilateral extensions. Corporate Judo. Vendors from IBM to Google learned to leverage open source both as community goodwill and as a stick against rivals, precisely the dynamic Microsoft once feared. From hostility to hybrid. Today, Azure is the world's largest commercial distributor of enterprise Linux machines. Visual Studio Code, open sourced under MIT license, tops developer surveys. Windows 11 ships with a full Linux kernel via WSL2, blending command line and GUI apps. In many data centers, Microsoft Stack now means Windows hosts running Kubernetes pods stuffed with Debian containers and managed by Azure control planes. The result is less kumbaya than detente. Microsoft still prefers you buy its cloud meters and office 365 seats, but it no longer tries to smother the penguin. Instead, it hires kernel maintainers and upstreams patches. 27 Halloweens later. The documents remain a cautionary tale in business schools and a rallying myth in open source lore. They demonstrate how quickly confidential bravado can metastasize into public relations disaster, how strategies forged in secrecy die in daylight, and how an ecosystem built on volunteer passion can out-iterate even the richest adversary. Whenever a tech titan proposes a new proprietary twist on an open protocol, veterans whisper, remember Halloween, the warning has lost none of its chill. 